Uh, yes, we're going to um, welcome back. Hope you had a nice cup of coffee or tea and, and some interesting conversations as well, hopefully. Um, we're going to uh, get a lot more practical um, in this, uh, our second session today. And, um, and there's going to be, uh, it's sort of broken up into three parts. So I'm going to chat for a bit and then we're going to get round tables and do some application. And um, that's going to happen three times. So um, you're gonna, we're going to work a bit harder together um, for this one. But uh, I think the sun is shining now, actually, outside, which is exciting. So we'll get energised for a sunny afternoon at the Hawley Carnival. Here we go. Um, so where have we been so far? That Let's just recap that... Um, Hopefully, we've learned together that God, or been reminded that God is the ultimate source of encouragement. He's the ultimate source of encouragement for the human heart, for our world, because he has intervened to deliver us from the sources of discouragement, not because he is a ticket out of difficulty, not because he just offers sympathy from the sky, but because he has actually intervened in history and in our reality to deliver us from the ultimate sources of discouragement. And Jesus' followers are not comforted to become comfortable, but to become comforters in the world. And we are best positioned to experience and offer that encouragement and comfort when we experience our own weakness and we learn to rely on God's strength. And so in this session, we're going to talk about three ways that Jesus' followers can bring or offer encouragement to the world. And these are three, um, the headings of these are three observations, and they come from me. So it's okay to uh, battle around with them. It's okay to disagree with them. They're not straight out of the pages of the Bible. Um, and, uh, and you will also have ideas about how you have put this into practice in your life, how you've experienced this, both on, on both ends of it as well. Um, but three ways that Jesus followers can bring encouragement. And the headings are showing up, sharing a headphone, and stepping in time. And those headings will become clear as we go through. Um, but the, the premise is that anybody and everybody who decides to follow Jesus gets to take up this job, this role of becoming a comforter and an encourager in the world. And um, let's go straight into way number one. We're going to talk about showing up. And here's the main point about showing up, that Jesus did not encourage the world from a distance. He encouraged the world by showing up and walking with us in the midst of discouragement. I thought it'd be helpful to, for us to reflect a little bit, and we want to get practical with this in order that we might actually offer encouragement to real people that we know, real people who are in our world and in our circle. And so perhaps we might um, find it helpful to think about what are the signs of discouragement? What might I be looking out for amongst my friends and my neighbours, in myself, in my community, um, that would let me know that somebody is currently experiencing discouragement and therefore there is an opportunity to bring some encouragement? And they would be things like uh, people who are experiencing a lack of zeal for life, so somebody who just seems like the spark's gone out of them. We know people like that, don't we? Somebody who um, is very pessimistic, um, somebody who appears to be very depressed, somebody who often voices their worry, um, somebody who's experiencing a lack of confidence or a lack of self-esteem, uh, somebody who's exhibiting apathy or hesitancy or a lack of confidence about something, people who are expressing purposelessness or anger or frustration or loneliness or confusion. All these things should trigger us to realize this person is experiencing discouragement. This person needs and wants access to the ultimate source of discouragement. When we meet people who express these things, when we realize that our friends and our family members and our neighbors are experiencing these things, they are opportunities to encourage. But the question is, how do we do that encouragement? Because it's easy um, to get this wrong. We've all tried Let's be real. We've all tried to share our faith in a positive, encouraging way, and it's absolutely gone terribly, hasn't it? Or it's landed completely flat, or we've completely chickened out of it. Isn't that, is that, I hope that's true. It's certainly true for me. <laughs> um, how do we actually offer encouragement? How do we share our, what encourages us in a way that actually brings encouragement to another person? 
And the best example we can look to is to Jesus himself. Jesus brought encouragement to hurting people by offering himself as a solution to the ultimate sources of discouragement for anybody who put their faith in him. And an interesting and helpful comparison is to compare the way that Jesus offered encouragement and the way that Jesus' contemporaries perhaps tried but really failed to bring comfort and encouragement to those around them. And the difference was that Jesus' contemporaries, the people we often see him in conflict with in the Gospels, the accounts of his life, like the religious leaders and the Pharisees, they encouraged people towards moral and legal perfectionism. That was their advice. That was their suggestion. This will help. This is what you need to do, is strive for moral and legal perfection. Whereas Jesus' encouragement was towards faith, was pointing people in the direction of confidence in God rather than increasing their confidence in themselves. And we see this, for example, if you think about um, times where Jesus, for example, is criticized for spending time with so-called sinners and tax collectors and eating with them. The, the criticism that comes from the Pharisees and the religious leaders, what the, the approach that the Pharisees and religious leaders would prefer to have is uh, that those people are told how to achieve a greater level of moral and legal perfection, and therefore their lives will be better. Therefore, they will um, be encouraged and find increased inner strength. But Jesus' approach to those people is to show up with them, to be with them, and to move them in the direction of faith. Jesus' contemporaries offered advice. They offered advice on how you could strengthen yourself. But they did not offer help or healing. They offered advice, but they did not offer help or healing. And this is a trap that all of us easily fall into especially if we've experienced positive effects as a result of following Jesus or being part of a church community, or even if we've experienced something positive as a result of some life hack that we've been trying out. We fall into the trap of offering advice, but not offering help or healing. And when people hear more advice coming from us than experiencing help from us, that's a problem if we're followers of Jesus. And the, and the reason it's a problem is because advice, and we know this, advice is not particularly encouraging or comforting. The difference is advice says, well, try to get from here to here. And always our response is, well, if I, you know, I've tried that. Like, <laughs> well, you know, I've tried that. Help says, can I accompany you from here to here? Advice says, try and get from here to here. Help says, could I... Could I do anything to move with you from here to here? Advice costs nothing from us, and it costs something of the other person, usually. Help costs us something, and usually benefits or adds something to the other person. Advice often comes across as condemnatory, even if it's well-intentioned. But help strengthens us. Advice can discourage us. Advice makes us feel like, well, they are able to do something that I'm not able to do. Help strengthens us. Help encourages us. Advice is often dispassionate. We don't have to be compassionate to offer advice. But help is relational. It requires us to empathize and to get involved in where the person is at. And Jesus offered help not advice. As Jesus' followers, we are therefore not here to offer advice to the world, but to offer ourselves as help and our saviour as healing. Now you might say, but I have fantastic advice, or the Bible has fantastic advice, but they need to know that, my friend needs to know that, my family member needs to know that, if only they knew that we don't forfeit our opportunity to speak into people's lives by helping them. We don't forfeit our opportunity to share something that's helpful from the biblical story. We don't forfeit our opportunity to share lessons we've learned by helping them. In fact, we gain opportunities to do so. But when we just offer advice, before we offer help, we lose our opportunity to encourage somebody. Now we might say, well, what if somebody doesn't want help? Or what if they haven't asked for help? I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to intervene and get involved in somebody's life if they don't want help. 
Well, the best help that we can offer to a discouraged friend or family member or neighbor or colleague is to show up for them, just as Jesus did, show up for them and with them in full recognition of their discouragement and demonstrate with our words and our actions our own faith and confidence that God is close to them and cares for them, to demonstrate by our words and our actions our own faith and confidence that God is close to them and cares for them as we help them. And uh, our, final, our, our second two sessions this morning, we're going to talk about how do we demonstrate in our words and our actions that God is close to somebody and cares for them in order to offer encouragement. But that's the one, uh, the, the difference we want to think about first and foremost this morning is the difference between offering advice and offering help. Jesus stepped in, offered himself as help. His contemporaries, the people who he was most critical of, offered only advice but no help. And we should be challenged ourselves as to whether we are more, offering, more often dishing out advice or actually offering ourselves as help and walking with those who need our help, even if we're desperate to give them some advice. <laughs> So um, we're going to go straight into our first sort of application exercise. I hope you're ready to be a little bit sociable with one another around your tables. Um, we're going to think about, and you could flip this question either way. When have, uh, when have we been offered advice rather than help? So you might find it easier to resonate with, oh, I remember a time when someone gave me advice and really I needed help. Um, or you might actually immediately be thinking of a time where you offered advice rather than offering help, and it may have backfired. And what was the outcome of that? So when have we been offered advice rather than help, and what was the outcome? And where are we tempted to offer advice but not offer help, and why do we often choose the former? If you're feeling brave and vulnerable, you can be very honest about this yourself, or you can speak in theoreticals about, well, humans naturally want to do this. You know, sometimes that's easier. But where are we tempted to offer advice but not offer help? And why do we often choose the former? Does that make sense? Okay, let's do uh, five minutes and we'll see how we're getting on. Um, and uh, maybe feed some stuff back from your tables um, in five minutes' time. Go for it. Okay. Does anyone, did, does anyone want to, you could be really mean and point at somebody else on your table who said something really interesting just then. <laughs> Go on, yeah. Jen. Oh, let's have a roving mic. <laughs> I'll kick off. Um, we had quite a lot of discussion actually, but one of the things that came up a couple of times was um, time. So actually, um, probably on both occasions where you might need somebody's time to help you and they haven't got the time, or the reason we've defaulted to offering advice is because that's quick mm. and you, you've got that at the, the, the tip of your tongue and you can bring that up quickly and the help journey is longer and you may not have the luxury of time either in that moment or throughout that, that journey of help. So that was well, one of yes, our main points. very good point. Very good point. I think also we're tempted to offer advice and not help in, in times where you feel, if I start offering help, can I cope with getting mm. dragged into a certain situation? Do I have that strength? Mm. And um, so then you might be more tempted to mm. go the advice route. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have to exercise a bit more wisdom. When it, if we're going to offer help rather than advice, we're going to have to offer help meaningfully to a few people rather than lots of advice to lots of people, aren't we? Yeah. Great. Go on, Neil. Say this against, against myself, but um, if I'm being honest, um, it's a lot easier to offer help to people I like mm. and to give advice to people that I don't care about. <laughs> yeah. So if Neil's offering you advice. <laughs> Angie's looking quite perturbed. <laughs> cool. 
That's good. That's good. We'll, we'll get an opportunity to talk more about these things, but thank you, Martin. Um, so that's number one is show up. And we talked about showing up to demonstrate in our words and our actions that God is close, our faith, that God is close and that he cares for that person, no matter what they believe themselves. And um, the second practice, the second way that we're going to talk about is I've called it sharing a headphone. It's how do we demonstrate with our words that God is close. And perhaps this is the, um, either this will be the piece of sharing your faith that you feel you've um, been taught about or practiced the most, about how do you actually talk about your faith, um, or it's the piece that you feel the most petrified by. Um, and both of those are normal responses. Um, but the, what, um, what we're going to talk about today is that for truth to actually encourage us, it must resonate with us. The, the difference between just hearing something that is true and hearing something that really connects and resonates within us and, in, and lifts us from the inside. Um, recently, uh, Matt, my husband and I, we went to, um, we were very kindly given tickets to go to the Royal Albert Hall to see, um, they're doing this films in what was it called? Films in Concert series where you go and you watch the film and they have a live orchestra playing the soundtrack. It's absolutely amazing. And we went to see Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark with the London Symphony Orchestra, which was incredible. And it so makes you appreciate the difference a soundtrack makes to a story and how you receive the story and the narrative and the words that go on. Um, in the story according to the soundtrack because it makes you feel something it actually lifts you you're sort of you resonate with what's going on on screen and it really made me think about the difference between um, sharing a story or sharing a piece of truth and sharing something in a way that really resonates with somebody that lifts them that they feel from the inside out and it made me think, well, what does it sound like when I talk about Jesus? Is it like a film with no soundtrack? Or does it have something that resonates with people? Um, what does the story of Jesus... And I think the question before the, that question of what does it sound like when I talk about Jesus is what does the story of Jesus sound like to me? You know, maybe I heard it for the first time when I was six or nine or 25 or 50 or 80 what does it sound like to me now? Does it sound like good news to me now? Is it a, a film with no soundtrack? Or does it lift me and encourage me and strengthen me? Does the good news actually sound like good news to me at the moment? Am I still resonating with it? And maybe sometimes the reason we have such a hard time talking about Jesus is if we've lost our own resonance with the story, that it doesn't lift us and sound like a story that we want to share with somebody else. Maybe um, so many people in our, in our culture, it would seem, would respond to the gospel with, well, that's just not my sound. You know when, when someone's really into a kind of music that just does nothing for you at all? Maybe we think that that's how a lot of people, our friends, neighbors, relatives, would respond to the story of Jesus. Well, that's just not my sound. It doesn't do anything for me. Um, and the message of Jesus can become this way for us. And it certainly has become this way in our culture, that our culture has heard a version of the story of Jesus that for many people hasn't resonated. And that can be really challenging for us because um, we think, well, if it's true, it must resonate, surely. If, it's, if it's something is true, it must resonate. But of course, we know, and we experience this, truth resonates most within us when it connects with our experience and our need. Truth resonates most when it connects with our experience, what we have what we have been through, what we have seen, what we know to be true, the reality we have experienced, and what we feel we need. And, I, you know, God knows this. And we know that God knows this because um, I love this phraseology in the Gospel of John where it says, the word, Jesus, the word, became flesh and lived among us. That's the beginning of the good news. That the word, which is the truth and the wisdom and the knowledge about God, became a human being and lived with us. That is, God 
knew that contextualizing truth into our experience and our need is the best way for it to resonate. And so the word, his wisdom, his knowledge, his truth became flesh, became, took on human flesh and lived amongst us, contextualized itself into our experience and our need. That in some sense, God tuned into the frequency of humanity in order that we might tune into the frequency of heaven. That's resonance is when the frequencies are aligned, right? That God tuned into the frequency of humanity in order that we might tune into the frequency of heaven. I don't know if you've ever sat on a train opposite somebody who has headphones on, um, who's reacting to what they're listening to, like either just like going for the subtle sort of nod or might become more extensive or they might laugh out loud sometimes or can be a bit <laughs> alarming, <laughs> Um, especially if you can't see that they have headphones in. That's, that's caught me out a few times. Um, but I don't know if you've ever... When, when I sit across from somebody who's obviously connecting with what they're listening to on their headphones, I would just love to pluck one of the headphones out of their ears and listen to it myself. You know, there's, there's an overwhelming temptation in me to do that. And um, I, I, want, I want to share a headphone with them, and I want to find out what they're listening to. And I love in this idea that the word became flesh and lived amongst us, that Jesus came and listened in to our headphones, that he came and listened in to what it sounds like to be a human being, even a human being who's estranged from God. It was like he came and sat opposite us and said, can I listen to what life sounds like for you? And then he offered his headphone to us that we would know what it could and should sound like to be a human being who's connected to God. So Jesus was able to offer real encouragement to people because he was willing to share a headphone with them and hear how the world sounded to them. And you see this time and time again in Jesus' interactions with people. Often he, already, he has the one up on us in that he already knows exactly what's going on in their life. But he speaks according to what he knows the world sounds like to them, doesn't he? You think of the woman at the well or the blind man, Bartimaeus. People who Jesus, was, Jesus first and foremost spoke into, what, do, what does the world sound like to this person? And how do I help them with what the world sounds like to me, with what God sounds like to me? And so when Jesus brought good news to people, it was specific. It was tangible. It resonated with people. It spoke into their experience and their needs. I think there's something, there's some permission we need to give ourselves in the fact that Jesus didn't have one presentation of good news that he repeated with every person, but that he responded to the person in front of him. He listened to what was going on in their world, and he shared the part of the good news that they needed to hear in that moment. And I think there's, some, there's permission we need to give ourselves there too, to, to not need to say everything all at once, and to not need to recite and um, rehearse a version of the good news that perhaps we were taught and trained to present to people, but to learn how to listen and then say something that actually will resonate with what that person has just shared with us. This is a key to saying something that resonates with people, is our willingness to share a headphone with them. And the first step to that is to listen and ask questions. To listen, what does the world sound like to you? What does the world sound like to my friend who has never been to church? What does the world sound like to my um, partner or to my granddaughter who ha- grew up with a faith but has walked away from it? What does the world sound like to you? What's their soundtrack? What's their sound? The more we listen, this is a principle I was reading about in a book I'm going to recommend in a moment. The more we listen, the more time we earn to share. And so the best thing that we can do is start listening and asking questions about what the world sounds like to somebody we want to encourage. And I would just suggest these three questions, and a couple of them we've already used today. What are they experiencing? What is this person in front of me experiencing right now? What do they need? Not what do I diagnose they need, but what do they feel they need? And what have they been offered? What have they tried? What have they looked for? And then to think about where is my common ground with this person? Human to human, 
What, what have we both experienced? Where does my experience connect with their experience? Where do my needs connect with the needs that they have just expressed? And is there an opportunity for me to share what Jesus is offering into that? I've experienced, I need, Jesus offers. We have experienced, we need, Jesus offers. For truth to encourage us, it actually needs to resonate with us. It needs to speak into our hearts. It needs to connect with our experience and our needs. And here's the reality of it. If it doesn't resonate, it won't encourage. And if it doesn't encourage, it will not motivate faith. We know this in our own lives. We've sat and listened to messages that haven't resonated, not from Martin, ever, but from other people. <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't resonate, it doesn't encourage. And if it doesn't encourage, it does not motivate faith. Um, we're going to break out into our groups again and talk about this in a moment. But before we do, I just want to recommend two really practical resources I've come across recently. It'd be great to hear if you have um, some resources that you find helpful in this area as well. But in thinking about what the good news sounds like to us and getting better at talking about it in a way that resonates with somebody else, and particularly in tapping into how we listen to somebody else's headphones and how we share our own. So um, one is a resource that's available on Right Now Media. You should be able to do so. Have a, yeah, you can access Right Now Media for, th for, for free through Hawley Baptist Church. Who's best to ask if somebody doesn't know how to do that? You. <laughs> <No>. Angie. <laughs> you can. It's on the website. There you are. It's on the website. Um, and this is a resource that's available for free on Right Now Media. It's called Evangelism, Evangelism Sharing the Big Story. It's from a guy called James Chung. It is, um, so I've, I have found it so helpful in terms of thinking about um, the good news and how we make the good news sound like good news again to people. Um, and then there's a book recommendation as well, um, which is by a guy called Sam Chan, How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy. <laughs> and uh, that's a phenomenally practical and helpful book um, about talking about Jesus. And a lot of that book is about how to get on the same page with somebody, how to really listen well, um, how to figure out what the world sounds like to them and speak good news into what they're actually sharing with you. Um, and so those are two practical books, uh, two practical resources, sorry, that I would highly commend to you. Um, if, if this is something that you want to get better at. Um, but let's, uh, let's go for some application questions. Firstly, um, if you want to talk with one another, when did the news about Jesus first resonate with you and why? What, not when did you first hear it, when did it first resonate with you and why? And then practice a sharing a headphone exercise with the people around you. So this is where we ask, what have you experienced recently? What do you need in the midst of that? And reflecting together on what Jesus offers into that. And it's a bit different doing it with people who share our faith. Um, but the, be the better we get at doing this with one another, uh, with people who share our faith, the, the more practice we have for taking this out with people who um, don't share our faith. Because at the end of the day, we're all... We're all human beings, and that's the best way to have these conversations is as two human beings, right? So um, you could practice in a group or practice one-to-one -one on your tables asking, well, what are you experiencing? What do you need? And reflecting together on what Jesus offers into that. Cool. Uh, we'll take another five-minute break, see how we get on, and then do some feeding back. So, yeah, let's um, so yeah. on our table, we just had um, an interesting point made by Martin about the fact that um, evangelism can often feel like, I've got to tell them about Jesus mm. now. Mm. <laughs> and the, the principle you're saying about the show and the headphone, actually, we're just saying it's a journey where that might be years down the line mm. where you are just listening in on their life, you're supporting them and the helping bit. And actually the sharing Jesus bit comes in in those moments when mm. the opportunity arises rather mm. than trying to force mm. something in. Well, that's very nice music, thank you, but listen to mine. Yes. You know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's trying to, to take that. Yeah, that's good. Next person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be in it. <laughs> 
Well, um, when Jesus has resonated with me, it's because I've been suffering with grief uh, very deeply in 2021. I lost one of my dearest best friends and I had an experience where I saw Jesus walking beside my mum and he said, don't let grief overtake you. Don't mm. let it wash over you. Let yourself grieve. Mm. I never had anyone else to experience that with. Mm. Mm. And it's resonated with me since. And the very first time was my baptism. Yeah. I had the warmth just wash over me. That's so good. I've had two fantastic experiences yeah. with Jesus. Yeah. That's a, thank you for sharing that. So that's a really powerful example of that, you know, we might hear the truth of Jesus is with you and then when it connects with, well, I'm experiencing real intense grief and I really need somebody to be walking with me now. That hits differently, doesn't it? But yeah, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. A little bit of humour. Answer the first question. I was about 12 and I was going to be a good boy today. I realised at the end of the day I had failed. <laughs> yeah. So I had to look elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when I first experienced of thinking about Jesus. No, more recently and seriously, um, I'm trying to think, linked to what we said here. There was someone we knew who um, needed certain things, help with the computer. Uh, in fact, it turned into inviting them in. Mm. and talking about their life. Mm. They had a lot of problems, and they'd been around the world regarding Christianity, and uh, they end up here. We just sat and listened, and um, I had the privilege of saying her just before she passed away, now you do trust on Jesus, don't you? Are you relying on him? And the affirmative were definitely. Mm -hmm. And um, she may have been a Christian for years, as far as mm. I know. <laughs> but um, that was listening to her about her family problems mm. and things she imagined as well. And I think that eased her quite a lot. So I hadn't realised till you spoke that that's what we've been doing. Yeah, brilliant. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Really encouraging. She just said, don't. When I first met Jane, um, one of the things she told me is that she's afraid of heights. And, I mean, I get it. If I was on the top of a really tall building and there was no rails or no windows or anything and standing on the edge, I think I'd, I'd be afraid. Um, but as an example, the, the, the Willis Tower in Chicago, I don't know how many feet tall, but like the Empire State Building thing, three-inch thick glass. I mean... Generally speaking, nothing's going to happen. We are way high up, but it doesn't matter. And in my headphone, it's, wow, I think I can see where my mom lives. How cool is this looking up here? What's in Jane's headphone is, oh, my God, this is crazy. I can't be, you know, how, it's going to fall. I'm going to fall down. There's almost no chance it's going to happen. But for me to be empathetic, I have to know what's, what's going on in, in, in her headphone. And it's the same thing. A problem that may seem small to us just is screaming in the other person's mm. in the headphone, and maybe that's, yep. that's an interesting way to think on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good, that's a good analogy. <laughs> good stuff. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, that's really, yeah, really encouraging to hear um, your own reflections on that, and... Um, yeah, I think keep living with that question of the, how, does the, how is the news resonating with you? And if we can always be asking that question, I think that's really powerful for us to stay connected to why is this good news to me right now? Um, and therefore, why is, it, why is it good news to the people whose lives I'm, I'm walking um, with them in as well? Um, so that's what we've done. Show up, share a headphone. And finally, step in time. This will become very important at the barn dance later. Um, but stepping in time, um, the, even worse than watching a movie without a soundtrack would be watching a movie where the sound is out of sync, right? Have you, I don't know if you've ever watched a video or something where the sound is just slightly off. It's just absolutely unbearable to watch. And um, that, that's something we have to um, be very sober-minded about when it comes to 
uh, demonstrating with our words our faith that God is close is how we're stepping in time to that truth. How do we demonstrate with our actions our confidence that God is close? The, the main point with, under this stepping in time is that, that Jesus authenticated his words of encouragement to others that God was close through his obedience to that God. And likewise, our obedience is what people hear the loudest. And to put it another way, our disobedience is what renders people the deafest. And we have seen the outcomes of this um, in, in our culture, that as soon as the church stops looking like a place where people follow Jesus, and as soon as the church stops following Jesus, nobody wants to hear what we have to say. The fastest way we lose the ability to encourage others through our faith in Jesus is by not placing our own faith in Jesus, funnily enough, (laughs) by faltering in our own resolve to follow. In other words, the least convincing way to let somebody know that God is close is by us living as if God is absent. The least convincing way to let others know that God is close is by us living as if God is absent. Jesus authenticated words of encouragement through obedience to God, through demonstrating his own faith in God. And likewise, our obedience is what people hear the loudest. We know that Christianity has lost its salience for people because of Christians who have not lived according to the way of Jesus, right? For some of us, that might be part of our story, why we walked away from church at one point, why we walked away from faith, because of Christians who have not lived according to the way of Jesus of Jesus. If our hope is that somebody we know might be encouraged that God has come close to them, intervened in reality to rescue us, then we must actually obey Jesus as our arrived king. It's what's exciting about you guys calling yourselves a community where Jesus is king, where we demonstrate by our actions that our authority comes from him. And this is not about being a good person. This is not... When you're a child, I remember growing up in church and thinking that as a child, being a witness for Jesus meant being a fantastic person, being a really good person who never swears, who never gets anything wrong, who's always kind, who always shares her lunchbox with other people. You know, it's being a fantastic person is being a witness. It's not about being a good person. It's about living as a surrendered person, a person who obviously has an authority, who is greater than them. All of us fail. All of us go astray. None of us are called to perform as great people, but we are called to follow, to obey. And the quickest way people stop listening is when we start living as if God is not a factor in our own lives. I actually um, found out recently, I said I really like exploring the roots of words. Um, I found out recently that in Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, the original language of the New Testament, the root word for obey and hear are very linked. So um, obey means to come under what you hear. And so there's a relationship between how people hear and how they see it working out in our lives. Obedience is literally coming under what you have heard. And so nothing authenticates the message, the thing that people hear, more than us actually coming under that message, actually obeying what we have heard. More, nothing authenticates the message more than its impact on our own lives. Jesus, often at the end of when he had been teaching a crowd, he used this funny phrase, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. I always thought it was a joke at the end of the um, parable of the sower about corn because he was making like a pun about ears and <laughs> ears of corn. But it, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus recognizes the difference. First of all, in what we talked about before, about the fact that truth, might, we might hear truth, but it doesn't necessarily resonate and connect with us. But he's also saying, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear, let, them, let it actually go into their lives. Let them come under what they have heard. Let them obey. 
And he affirms this when he says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, one of his most famous collections of teachings, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock and nothing could shake it. If anyone has ears to hear, Jesus said, let them hear. Let them come under what they have heard. Let them shape their life around what they have heard. And this tells us, I think, that the best way people hear is when we obey. The best way people hear, our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, is when we obey, when we actually do what Jesus is asking us to do. Not to perform it, not to show off about it, but to quietly obey the words of our King. And it actually works. And you have probably experienced this. In fact, this might be part of your story. When somebody shows up and actually lives like Jesus and actually loves like Jesus, that is really encouraging, isn't it? You and I have been encouraged by those people on our journey. And it resonates with us. It's real. It's genuine. It's something different. And it makes a difference to us. The best way people hear is when we obey. So those are the three really practical steps I want us to think about today. Number one, show up. Show up, not to just give advice, but to offer ourselves as help and our saviour as healing. Number two, practice sharing a headphone. Listen to what others are experiencing and needing and share our own story, share our own headphone. And step in time by demonstrating by our actions, our faith in our arrived King Jesus, the one who is walking with us through our obedience to him. Let me just remind us as we come into land of the verse that um, the, the climax almost of what Paul said to the church in Corinth. He comforts us, God comforts us in all of our troubles so that, for a purpose, so that we can comfort others, so that we can encourage others. When they are troubled, and we know people, don't we, who are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given to us. Don't we want that for our friends and our family members and our colleagues and our community and our world? Don't we know people who are experiencing trouble? And haven't we experienced, aren't we experiencing trouble? But Paul's message to that church and to us is that God comforts us. He encourages us. He actually is the ultimate source of encouragement in order that we might be a source of encouragement for others, in order that we might comfort others with the same comfort that God has given to us. I'd love to pray for us and then we'll um, do some music, one song. And I've got some questions for us to take away that perhaps we can talk about over lunch as well. But let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, um, we are so thankful that you did not offer us comfort from afar and that we do not have to rely on a God who simply offers sympathy from the sky but that you came to live amongst us, to directly intervene in, on our behalf, to deliver us from all the sources of discouragement, to strengthen us from within. That You did that through the life of your son, that you did that through dying and putting to death the sources of discouragement, through conquering death in your resurrection, and then by giving us your spirit, your presence with us, strengthening us from the inside out. And we pray that that would not just land as good news for us, um, but that we would recognize that that is good news for the world. That is good news for our friends and our colleagues and our neighbors and our family members who might not know you yet, but are looking for a source of encouragement in their lives. Would you help us to put these things into practice? Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Help us make the costly decisions to show up, to invest time in helping others rather than just offering advice from a distance. Help us 
get better at listening, really listening to others. Give us wisdom and give us ears to hear what other people are saying to us about what they're experiencing and needing and what they are looking for and how we might share you with them. And Lord, we pray that you would humble us and make us obedient to your words, to the things, that the truth that we long for others to grasp. We pray that that would actually be a lived out reality in our lives. And we want to encourage one another on the journey of being obedient to you, of following you, and of living as if you are our arrived king, as we trust you are. And we pray for the rest of today, would you encourage us and um, that uh, we would uh, not walk away from here, leaving what we have heard behind, but that we would put it into practice in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, speaking of which, as the band come up, yes, that's fine. Um, just a couple of questions for you to take away. Maybe talk about these over lunch or maybe make a personal note. What have you heard today that will stay with you? And what are you going to do with what you have heard?